everyone and welcome back to my channel. Welcome to part two of my vlog in which I look at the movie Mona Lisa Smile through the lens of art history and from an art historical perspective. Now if you haven't done so already make sure to check out my channel and go ahead and click that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you don't miss any of my future fortnightly posts. Now if you missed part one of this vlog make sure to check it out before watching any further. Otherwise let's pick up right where we left off. Sunflowers Vincent van Gogh 1888 so we are back in a classroom setting and Catherine Watson is showing her students three paintings by the Dutch post-impressionist painter Vincent van Gogh. These works of art are Sunflowers of 1889, The Starry Night painted in June of 1889, one year prior to his death, and his 1888 self-portrait that was dedicated to his artist friend Paul Gauguin. In the movie, this is the painting on the right page of the open book. That on the left is a later copy of this very self-portrait by Judith Gerard and another artist. Now it's a shame that we see this portrait in black and white in the movie because colour is really significant here. Van Gogh has used this striking and almost gaudy turquoise green for the entire background of this self-portrait and that was incredibly radical and incredibly modern. He was not afraid to let feeling rather than observance govern his still life works and his paintings, depicting what were sometimes seen as crude but undoubtedly honest and vulnerable works of art. As Catherine herself explains, Van Gogh refused to conform and to compromise his integrity. Now during his life this meant that he was unfortunately not received too well. In fact he never sold a single one of his paintings. But now he is incredibly famous and celebrated as one of the seminal artists of post-impressionism. Catherine depicts his legacy by showing the girls a paint-by-colours version of his works of art. Despite his initially rough reception, 60 years later, in the context of the film, he is being celebrated as a model, a mould for us to copy. Now the message that Catherine is trying to get across in this scene before she's interrupted by Elizabeth is that you can choose to challenge and to break boundaries rather than choosing to conform. Much like Jackson Pollock, who we saw in part one, Van Gogh represents the idea of unforgivingly embracing your own unique vision and not compromising your beliefs. In light of the film, I think Catherine herself can be seen as some sort of Van Goghian figure. Catherine's views might not be accepted in this very moment, especially by Elizabeth but she will be praised and thanked in the very near future. Okay, let's fast forward to the next classroom scene in which Catherine bombards her students with contemporary advertisements. What she calls contemporary art. She shows them four advertisements for a cleanser, a tape measure, a condiment and girdles, all featuring dolled up idealized women and families in staged poses and settings decorated with eye-catching phrases of text. Now, what I find interesting about this scene is that we as an audience have perspective we have historical distance and that makes it much easier for us to look at these advertisements and in particular to look at them as art. Catherine is being very clever here by presenting the then current advertisements as she would present any of her other works of art. She's allowing the girls to see them as works of art and therefore she's granting them the power of objectivity and the ability of criticism and deconstruction. What will the future scholars see when they study us? These are essentially propagandistic posters with catchy slogans that propagate a certain lifestyle and she is allowing the girls to see that. Okay, next, Bill gives Catherine her Christmas present, which is a set of binoculars containing slides of famous works of art. Together with Catherine, we see Michelangelo's infamous Renaissance fresco of God creating Adam on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo's idealized sculpture of the biblical savior of Israel, David, who became the symbol of Florence and the metaphor for the Florentine people's strength, intelligence and perseverance. If you're interested in knowing more about David, you can check out my vlog number two, which is entirely about him. Thirdly, we see Venus de Milo, an ancient Hellenistic sculpture of Aphrodite that was discovered on the island of Melos in 1820. And finally, Leonardo da Vinci's infamous Mona Lisa herself, who is to become a recurrent character in the film. We will come back to her. The works of art in the binoculars are staple works of art in the history of art. I think they very clearly show Bill's desire to win Catherine's heart over. And secondly, they propagate the persona that he has created for himself, namely cultured persona who has visited Italy and other places in Europe, which turns out to be complete fiction. All right, let's return to Mona Lisa herself and let's delve a little deeper into this infamous work of art. She appears twice more throughout the course of the film. This is without a doubt the most famous painting in the entire world. It's a Renaissance portrait of the wife of a wealthy Florentine cloth merchant, Lisa Gerardini. And for those of you who didn't know, Mona is actually a contraction of my lady, Madonna in Italian. Now this painting is famous for breaking the boundaries when it came to Italian portrait painting. For the first time, the sitter is shown facing the viewer instead of sitting in profile. 
It's also famous for the sfumato technique employed by Leonardo da Vinci. Sfumato is a smoky blended haziness that softens the harsh outlines and makes the sitter come alive. However, what is most famous about the painting is the sitter's ambiguous smile. For years, art historians and the general public have been spellbound by this ambiguous and unrevealing smile that doesn't make clear what the Mona Lisa is feeling. And that's the exact aspect of the painting that the movie exploits. Look at this mother. She's smiling. Is she happy? She looks happy. So what does it matter? This painting, in the context of this scene, is particularly relatable to the character of Elizabeth and her attempt to appear happy in what is clearly a loveless and unfaithful marriage. We see a very similar ambiguous smile on Elizabeth's own face throughout the movie. The very last time that the Mona Lisa appears in the film is in a classroom setting when the girls are discussing the painting. So in the context of the film, Mona Lisa really sums up the danger of not living by your own rules and the feelings of entrapment that can come from that. And finally, the very last work of art, or works of art in this case, that appear in the film are a series of paint-by-number variations of Van Gogh's sunflowers executed by each and every one of Catherine's students as a parting gift to her. Again, art is being used to send us, the viewer, a message. In this case, these paint-by-numbers suggest that the girls are listening to Catherine. They are building off of the foundations she has laid for them. They now have the knowledge and the awareness that they are able to choose for themselves, and then they each succeed in making their own individual life choices. So I think the ultimate message that these works of art are expressing is to question what kind of life you want. I know exactly what I'm doing and it doesn't make me any less smart. Pursue your own want, your own personal vision for yourself, whether that means going to law school or having a family at home or doing both. Alright guys, that is it for me today. I really hope you enjoyed exploring all the works of art that are featured in this brilliant movie. As we have seen, the works of art are incredibly strategic and they act as very effective visual metaphors for the girls' feelings and progressions and points of view throughout the course of the movie. If you happen to notice something that I didn't, let me know about it in the comment section down below, as well as any other questions that you might have. Give this video a like if it changed or if it deepened your perspective on the film Mona Lisa Smile. Also, let me know what you'd like to see next from me. As always, thank you ever so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.